Good morning and welcome to the press conference of the Committee on Foreign Interference in All Democratic Processes in the European Union, including disinformation. Today, the chair of the committee, Mr. Rafael Glucksmann, and the rapporteur of the committee, Madame Sandra Carniete, is going to brief you about the work done so far and will answer your questions afterwards. First, let me give the floor to the chair. Mr. Glucksmann, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, when we wanted to create this uh, committee, it was based on a very simple assessment. A hybrid warfare has been declared on our democracies, European democracies, and until now the response has been uh, quite weak and not efficient enough. The time has come to an end when we uh, were thinking to live uh, in the midst of the end of history without adversaries, without enemies, without big conflicts. Truth has prevailed that we are under threat and that you have foreign actors, hostile regimes, that actually are organizing an assault on our institutions, our uh, civil debate, and our political uh, elections. And this assault has to be met with big changes in our uh, organization, internal, and in our foreign uh, policy. So that, that's the idea of the committee. During the first months of this committee, we have made an assessment of the level of threat. We have made an assessment of the uh, attacks against our democracies and of the loopholes of our both legislations and uh, political uh, system. Yesterday, we had uh, the High Representative Borrell, Mr. Borrell, who came to speak to us. We also spoke with uh, uh, Madame Jourova, with Mr. Breton. And what we can say is that there is a rising awareness in the uh, European uh, uh, institution about the threats that we are confronted with. But when it comes to the actual uh, means to fight these threats, what we have witnessed, and yesterday once again, is that the means given to the protection of our democracies are very weak, and that the regimes attacking our democracies, uh, especially the Russian regime and the Chinese regime, because they are the two main threats that we could assess now, these regimes don't think that they have to pay a price for these attacks. And until now, the reaction of our institutions has been quite soft. And therefore, there is no deterrence. So the, the aim of the committee in the coming months will be to uh, actually shape the tools that will protect our democracies, offer legislative tools, offer change of uh, means attributed to this uh, defense, and also uh, to shape uh, clear advice on what could be retributions when it comes to the attacks of our democracies. Uh, I will be uh, very happy to respond to your question. I'm not here to make a long speech, but uh, first I, I will give the floor to our great rapporteur, uh, Madame Calignete, and I'm very happy to hear from her. Uh, thank you, Thierry, and I'm uh, very happy to meet the journalists. Good morning to everybody. Um, uh, I will continue where uh, chairman of the committee just ended, because fighting of this information is urgently needed, and more than ever. And if we look at wherever, in Myanmar, in Belarus, in Russia, and uh, then we think about the last weeks and days of Trump in America, it is evident. And uh, there is also the conscience that Washington, events in the Washington were really shaking the foundations of democracy, quite literally. And I'm speaking about um, attack to capital, and uh, then we also have to think about uh, different sort of uh, attacks on quality media, 
inside the European Union in some of our uh, member, state, uh, member states. And I think I'm not mistaken if I would say that we have broad consensus in our committee that problem of the online disinformation and its exploitation for foreign interference is extremely severe and demands immediate action. Um, disinformation, however, um, is not far away. It's here, around the corner. And uh, it is right in our daily life. Uh, think of the huge disinformation campaign around COVID and the vaccination strategies. Um, um, we should be aware that what we see in social media is only a small visible part of the iceberg beyond which lies enormous financial resources and vested geopolitical interests. And I like to compare this information with the human body, where the flow of blood is money, uh, it's a blood circulation and social platforms are its nervous system. The challenge is how to make EU immune against this foreign interference and how to find the right doses of the vaccine against perpetrators. So now I will, I will try to um, tell about the state of play uh, of our work in the special committee uh, and uh, about our schedule. Um, uh, now, uh, it is clear that we will start the core work on the Inge report only after summer break. Meanwhile, I will uh, prepare three more working documents. The second one, uh, which I hope I will be able to present in midst March, uh, is a working document on covered funding uh, of political activities by foreign donors. And uh, in this uh, paper, I will address different ways of interference from the third countries, uh, transparency issues, possible caps for political funding, sanctions, economic influence. And I also will speak about an even uh, national legislation uh, of political party, financing of political parties in member states, because it also opens the loopholes for uh, financing from third countries. Then uh, next document will be on online platforms uh, covering, among other issues, fake accounts and um, other non-authentic activities, uh, problems of algorithms, monetization of sensational content. Um, I... Uh, uh, hope to present it um, uh, around 10th of May uh, in order to align it with a study on similar topic which is requested by uh, our committee. And the last fourth working document on resilience I am planning to present in June and in this document I will uh, try to cover both institutional and civic resilience, which is a very complex um, uh, issue. I also would like to emphasize on quality journalism, how to strengthen it, on education and resilience in our neighborhood, which is important for European Union. I hope it will be uh, at, ready at the end of June. And after summer, uh, I will focus all my attention to the drafting of final report. I hope that uh, after compromise amendments and negotiations, we will be able to vote in committee on this um, in December. And then uh, at the latest in the March next year will be vote in plenary. Mm, uh, uh, what I would like to add that uh, um, I will follow very carefully like all col my uh, colleagues from committee on everything which is going um, 
in implementation of European Democracy Action Plan uh, and how the legislative committees are working on um, Digital Service Act and Digital Markets Act. And to conclude, I would like to share with you what our expectations are from platforms, uh, the Commission and Member States in principle. For Commission, I would wish to keep ambitions high. We expect the Commission to pursue its ambitions as a global standard setter and to encourage other co-legislators to move forward swiftly and with courage. There is no doubt that there will be serious resistance and lobbying uh, of the influential big tech corporations, and that is it, that it is imperative that the EU avoid dilution of this legislation. Uh, then, what to expect from the platforms? Good will. Um, I would like to underline that there is nothing illegal or anti-competitive about building a successful business, uh, which is what many large platforms are. But the digital giants have to acknowledge that freedom, uh, um, acknowledge that they are much more than business as usual. Their responsibilities are much, wi much wider and their decisions have huge impact for the very health and resilience of democratic institute, institutions. And for member states, uh, I expect ability to agree for the common good. The use measure must be implemented as soon as possible, as further delays run the risk of individual member states implementing national legislation creating the nightmarish scenario of a patchwork of 27 national framework. Thank you, and I'm ready for your questions. Thank you to the two speakers. And now the floor is uh, of the journalists. Let me remind you um, that in order to ask your questions, you have to push the raise hand button, and then we will give you the floor um, and the other thing is, please state uh, your name and, uh, and, and the media that you are working from. The first question is for Finbar Birmingham from the South China Morning Post. The floor is yours. Press the speak button, please. Hi. Um, I had a question about um, how prominent and how much the growing awareness or whether there is growing awareness about um, China's role in disinformation. I guess the role of Russia is quite prominent in the um, parliamentary sessions we've seen um, yesterday and I guess in a lot of the committee hearings, but among parliamentarians and, and, and generally uh, in Europe, is the role of, of China uh, since COVID um, becoming more of a, a talking point, and do you expect this to be um, a large part of, of your your findings um, in the coming in the coming months? We had a little technical issue. Could you please say this, the question once more? Uh, sure. Apologies. Um, my question was: Do you expect? A, um, have you seen a, a rising awareness of China's role in the spread of this information in Europe? Um, has that risen over the past um, period of, of coronavirus? And do you expect it to be um, uh, to form a large part of the work going forward? Because Russia seems to be very prominent and very dominant um, in, in the uh, parliamentary hearings and so on. But I'm wondering whether you expect China to take on a, a large role as well. Thank you. Uh, Yes, we expect it for sure. And uh, the last year has, uh, has, ra has ra risen uh, awareness about uh, China's uh, actions in terms of uh, disinformation campaigns, obviously connected to the uh, pandemic. 
But our committee is not only about uh, disinformation campaigns. Uh, it's about foreign interference in general. And the rising awareness about China's role is not limited to a uh, disinformation campaign and connected to the pandemia. We have an issue with uh, uh, strategic infrastructure in our, in our countries, and we discussed this with Commissar, Commissioner Breton. We have uh, an issue of uh, Chinese investment in this strategic infrastructure. We have also issues of... Uh, of um, our uh, institution being penetrated by Chinese uh, influence, Chinese interest. We have issues of uh, uh, former uh, leaders of our countries uh, starting to work for Chinese interests, uh, uh, be it in France, for instance, or in other um, member states. So, of course, China will be... Uh, and is already, but will be more and more a, a huge part of, of our work. And it, w one interesting thing when we uh, are discussing uh, about uh, foreign actors uh, interfering in our democracy is that they don't have the same, exactly the same strategy. And that's why we spend so much time uh, making analysis uh, and diagnosis, establishing a diagnosis uh, of, of this uh, of these attacks, because the Russian way to, to interfere in our democratic system is not the Chinese way, and so the response should be adequate to the uh, type of attack and type of strategy adopted. But definitely, uh, to respond to your question, uh, China is one of the main problems and the main threats we are facing. And the response we got yesterday from uh, the uh, high representative Borrell uh, cannot satisfy us. Uh, and I don't think it satisfies himself when we say that we don't have uh, the mandate to uh, uh, work on the Chinese uh, attacks or that we l are lacking people even speaking Chinese in our administration to confront this threat. It's just uh, uh, a proof uh, that we need this committee, that we need uh, uh, our recommendation, and that we need to change uh, uh, our policies because uh, we are confronting uh, very powerful systems that are investing a lot in these uh, interferences. And in, in, in our response, we have very limited means. And people need to start to be aware that you can't uh, defeat this kind of attacks with uh, 30 people and without anybody speaking Chinese in the institutions. That's, that, that's a huge issue we are having now. And, uh, and this is why our work is, is, I think, essential, is that we need to be serious. It's, it's not, a, as you understand, it's not a matter of a left, right, conservative, progressive. It's totally transpartisan. Now we have to uh, actually... Uh, come to, 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 to a kind of, uh, of serious attitude when it comes to defend our, our, our democratic system. And until now, uh, the way we confronted China's penetration, not only disinformation, I insist, it's, it's also uh, uh, going, so if you take the example, for instance, we have studied it, but uh, of uh, uh, Huawei uh, penetration and the way uh, the debate was shaped in, Euro in Europe about strategic infrastructure being shaped by Huawei. This is yet another example of the naivety that has prevailed for, for too long and that we have to change. So yes, China is and will be even more uh, a huge topic for our committee. Thank you. Now the floor is Madame Cagnette. Uh, thank you. I would like to add that uh, uh, in European Parliament, the understanding of Chinese problem certainly is much clearer than different and diverging and vested interests of member states. And many of the decisions which uh, will be taken and are taken, uh, they are uh, taken uh, by Council uh, negotiating in dialogue with other European institutions. And um, uh, the current stand of uh, some of leading member states is not facilitating uh, the, uh, I would say, say the, the determined policy against the disinformation and intervention in democratic processes coming from China. Thank you. Thank you. 
Before we go on to further questions from online, we have a question from the room. Please uh, press the mic button and state where you are coming from. Uh, bonjour, Camille Sori, je suis Agence Europe. Du coup, je pose... I am from Agence Europe. I will ask my question in French. I think there's a huge amount of work you're trying to be doing here. And if you had one measure you take as a priority, what would that be? Well, thank you very much. It's nice to have someone who's actually uh, in the room. One particular measure? Well, I certainly don't want to uh, overstep when it comes to Mrs. Kenyatta's work or the rapporteur's work. But there are a number of legislative measures to be taken. Uh, financing of political parties, for example, I think that's absolutely key. I would say probably, though, the first measure to take, it's not so much a measure, it's more a state of being. And I think there needs to be a cost, there needs to be repercussions to these types of attacks. We saw this in the recent visit to Moscow and Mr. Borrell went to Moscow. There's no consequence, there's no cost for these types of attacks. We are going to develop legislative means to defend our democracies, to deal with those entities who are attacking uh, democracies. Now, the troll farm, of course, in uh, St. Petersburg, we're not officially... Russian actors, but I think we're missing something today. And what we need to start with is political will, otherwise everything else will be useless. So uh, the very first thing we need to do is to send much firmer political messages when it comes to those who are politically responsible. These Russian actors, they are clearly not acting without the orders of the Russian political authorities. These destabilization campaigns against our institutions, there's a political decision behind that. So we need to send a very firm political message. There's also a whole range of measures, legislative changes that could be uh, made, uh, greater resources to STRATCOM, to the administrations that protect our democracies against these types of campaigns. That is the work of our campaign to draw up these legislative ideas, proposals. But as I said, first of all, we start with a political message and we make it clear that there's a cost to these types of attacks against our democracies. We're uh, often told when we say we have to be tougher with China or with Russia, we're often told, well, you can't deal with human rights. Everybody, uh, everywhere, you can't interfere in other countries' uh, internal situations. But we're talking about defending our institutions, our democracies, against already existing attacks. So the ultimate responsibility of all political representatives, whether it's the member states or at a European level, their responsibility when they take office is to protect their institutions and to protect them from external attacks. The problem that we face is that the people who perpetrate these attacks, the people who order these types of attacks, think that they can get away with it. They think there will be no consequences and as long as that remains the case, these attacks will uh, continue whatever legislation we put forward. Thank you. Madam Kanyete. Uh, yes, I would like to continue where uh, President just uh, finished his uh, um, response because uh, many of those uh, prices to pay are out of the reach of our committee and one of the most important, of course, uh, these are sanctions and sanctions which could touch the real um, center of corruption in Moscow, in real center of those who make the political decisions. But when they look to the existing procedures and legislation, it is very lengthy, incomplete. For instance, Magnitsky list, which was adopted, does not include corruption as one of the criteria for including in the list. And uh, for instance, if we really want 
uh, than to make pain. Uh, just let's stop Nord Stream 2 building because with every next uh, day, week and month, Europe is becoming more dependent on Russia's energy, which means also political dependence. And when you look to the last decision uh, regarding sanctions, there are only four persons that is the noise going around, which uh, are included because there were no uh, unity in the council. And that, as Thierry just said, lack of political will. Thank you. Thank you, Madame Carniete. Now the floor goes to Christian Spilman of AFP. Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Yes. Bonjour. Oui, alors j'ai deux questions. Good morning. There are two questions relating to what you've been saying, Ms. Kaliade. You say that member states are not facilitating our work. But wouldn't transparency be helpful to try and call out the, on the, the states that are blocking things, that are blocking progress, that are flirting with China or with Russia that are continuing to build Nord Stream. You know, let's look, say things clearly. Germany, if Germany doesn't tow the line, then no one else will be able to do anything. So you, your parliament adopted a resolution talking about making oligarchs spreading disinformation pay and calling out uh, those oligarchs. But if you can't do anything if the, the legal services are saying, well, we don't have anything to do get them on. You know, we can talk about Sputnik, we could talk about the disinformation that's being spread. So, you know, it's, we've got the FP being threatened with being excluded. So, you know, we have to try to bring together geopolitics, member states, the will to impose um, policies and to tackle impunity. Is uh, addressed to me, uh, that is the eternal question, how to reconcile geopolitical interests, vested interests, and uh, what everybody knows, what is the right proceedings and how we can achieve our goal. And only step by step, because you cannot uh, deny that uh, uh, slowly that we are moving in the right direction, also including the interference in, of foreign uh, forces in uh, our um, democratic institu work of our democratic institutions and threatening the democracy. Uh, what you just touched is a fundamental uh, question, how to build the resilience. And and uh, I uh, uh, I am prepared, together with my colleagues from the uh, Inge Committee, uh, to provide a, a fundamental chapter in my report. What are the measures and the instruments institutionally and uh, of uh, civil society we can use to strengthen and build up the resilience against this interference in uh, democratic processes in, in Europe. To name and shame, I don't think that it helps because everybody knows who are the countries wanting uh, Nord Stream, uh, France and Germany, uh, who are um, uh, wanting to engage in the closer dialogue with Russia, etc., who are standing behind uh, China or trying to pick out any um, mention of Khashoggi mur uh, murder and Saudi Arabia. We know all that, but uh, that's why we have elections. Uh, and uh, there is change of the uh, membership in the European Parliament and with every next parliament. Uh, attitude is changing. Thank you. Si je peux ajouter quelque chose. Uh, if I may quickly add something. We do know that in Berlin and Paris you get the sort of the potential there to take a serious stance. It's not just Germany and when you talk about China or Russia the, the, it's not just a German position that's difficult here. It's not f fair to say that uh, Paris was uh, squeaky clean on, on that. So I think we have to 
We have problem with member states that depend on China, not just Germany. Countries that de are dependent on China because of a strategic uh, ties. We talk about Portugal, Greece, for example, and it should really cause us to question our own industrial policy and industrial uh, s s sustain, um, autonomy. Now, but these are are questions we need to ask ourselves on um, now I don't think you can I'm, I don't want to compare Sputnik and Russia today with AFP but when it comes to disinformation it's not a, a war of against fake news alone there is a wide ranging offensive on our institutions in the form of cyber attacks on hospitals healthcare and other strategic structures, the banking system, there's party financing as well. Now, I'm not saying we need to be taking, you know, we need to look at the far right uh, political parties and their fun funding structures as well. So we're talking here about a very broad ranging issue, not just the narrow scope of Sputnik or Russia today disseminating fake news. We need to understand what the situation is and come up with comprehensive responses. And clearly this will shake up thinking in many areas. It will shake up thinking in Berlin. If we really want to take seriously the threats on democracy, we need to take a hard and honest look at the rather flexible stance that we've seen with regard to China and Russia in recent times. We can respond to this decline of democracy in Russia or the absence of democracy in China in different ways. But when it comes to our own democracies being undermined, our own democracies being attacked, we really have to take a firm stance and one thing that will no longer be acceptable will be to say that you're attacking our democracies but let's keep going with business as, uh, as usual anyway you can say on the one hand look yes we disagree with what you're doing with your attacks but let's at the same time continue with Nord Stream and this and that and the other project you know I think it needs to be very clear to anyone attacking you that that will entail consequences and that is going to have to uh, change the discourse that we hear from European capitals. Out of time, um, we have one more question. I would like to give the floor to Ansis Evans. Please press the speak button. Ansis Evans, please press the speak button. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My question is, uh, is there evidence that this information is really hindering process of vaccination in Europe and also uh, uh, making path to uh, Western made vaccines and trust for them? Uh, I th th there is a clear impact on the numbers of people in Europe trusting the, the vaccination or not, the vaccine or not. And we see numbers uh, that are sometimes very low in our member states. And what we have identified is that this uh, disinformation on the vaccine were supported by the usual relay of, of, of for instance, the Russian uh, propaganda machine in Europe. Whether it has an impact on the actual vaccination campaign, uh, honestly, I can't say. And I doubt it because we have other issues that are preventing us uh, from uh, being very quick on the vaccination process. So even if you have low numbers in the trust in the vaccine, uh, the main reason why we are not uh, ahead of UK, for instance, it's not, uh, let's face it, it's not disinformation campaigns. It's a, a problem of ordering and, and organizing this vaccination uh, campaign. So I, I would not put the blame on, on, uh, on the propaganda machine of the Kremlin why we can't have uh, 
um, a very quick vaccination campaign in Europe. That's not the main issue. But it's for sure it has an impact on the numbers of citizens trusting uh, the, vaccine, the vaccine per se. Thank you, Madame Carniete. I cannot speak about uh, data on, on uh, other member states uh, of the Union, but um, research made, uh, study made in Latvia, show a very, very clear link between uh, uh, disinformation, uh, education, and, um, and uh, uh, will to, to be vaccinated or not. Uh, so I can affirm that at least in Latvia it works uh, quite, it has quite important impact on those who will, uh, who are expressing uh, will to be vaccinated and uh, those who say they never will uh, do this dangerous job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have come to the end. Thank you for the questions and thank you for our two speakers for the answers. Uh, thank you for the participation and have a nice day.